Welcome to Falcon Space. Today is September 21st, the fall equinox, and there hasn't been an update from the lab in a while. Just wanted to show you what we have going on with our latest experiment. Right now we are working on the Alzafon experiment, which is um, based on the paper from Frederick E. Alzafon, published in 1981, Anti-Gravity with Present Technology, Implementation and Theoretical Foundation. The theory and experiment are laid out over here. Basically you have a sample of aluminum iron inside of a laminar magnetic field. Um, there needs to be a pulsing of a microwave source on the sample, um, as well as an FM detector and, and all these other items. Let me show you exactly what we have going on here. As, there also needs to be a scale that holds the samples to see if there is any weight loss. So first off, uh, this is our equipment. Over here we have a little spy camera which is uh, just powering up right now. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to connect in a moment. That shows us the sample and the RF uh, receiver. This is our signal analyzer which hooks up directly to that um, RF receiver. It goes up to 22 gigahertz. Um, our signal generator is down over here. This is from FMI. It's, uh, I think it's serial number 10. It was the 10th one ever made. It, it goes from 9 to 9.5 gigahertz and it runs off of a simple um, vacuum tube inside and it's all mechanical inside. So the uh, numbers on the frequency gauge we found they're, they're pretty inaccurate. We're relying on the numbers coming out of our signal analyzer for a more accurate reading. This goes into a traveling wave tube amplifier, which we actually had to modify. It was broken when we received it. Uh, we fixed it up and now it's working. Um, this over here is my laptop. It's hooked up to a scale that's inside the Faraday cage, which is on the other side of this uh, wall. For the power supply, this is another thing we had to modify. Uh, Jeremiah over here is holding the camera. actually um, took it apart. We had to modify the different... Uh, um, Oh, you can show, show exactly what you did inside. Yeah, basically, we just swapped out the front pots. So this this thing had a uh, ten or a uh, what is it? Ten turn pot, seven turn pot. It's some weird uh, ratio potentiometer. There's the piece right there. Uh, it had a fine voltage adjustment, but absolutely nothing for the current adjustment except for this really cheapy little 5k here. And we swapped it out, uh, replaced the two because they were a five volt reference rail. So we got a lot more precision on the uh, current range, and we also put a biasing resistor in there, so we got a bit more precision exactly where we needed it. Right, and this resistor over here, the shunt that we added to the circuit, gives us a much more accurate reading on exactly what's going on. We had to chop it away to give us a higher resistance reading, and as we power up the power supply for the um, electromagnet, you can see we're reading here uh, 34.2 uh, millivolts on the shunt. That gives us a much more accurate reading as to what is going on on that electromagnet. Now, yeah, what... So in this case, we uh, when we chop the shunt, the current doesn't matter all that much. We just need to make sure that it's extremely stable. So we calibrated against another Fluke multimeter. It is 50 millivolts at 10 amps and simply sliced away until we got to that point. It's pretty thermally stable. So if you're wondering why the weird shunt we're just monitoring the current of the output from the uh, power supply to make sure that it does not drift around because it needs to be really stable or the results won't be uh, verifiable. Um, another important thing that we have going on here, of course, is the Gauss meter. Now, we did have this Gauss meter, which is a Chinese variant. Uh, it's the TD8620. Unfortunately, right when we uh, were ready to test our um, electromagnet, we found that the Hall effect sensor was actually broken. It got damaged from um, basically getting destroyed by metal. The um, I, I think parts of the electromagnet fell on it while we were transporting it, and um, e even with our attempts to uh, repair it, 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 it didn't work. So we picked up this one over here. This is actually an analog um, Gauss meter that we got from a company here in New Jersey, MPS, Magnetic Products and Services. It's an analog one. It has, uh, what is it, eight different stages of, of um, Gauss readings. And we're having trouble with this one as well um, because on the 3000 set, it, it'll max out, but on the 10,000, it'll show us 3,300 Gauss. We need much more accurate readings than that in order to run the experiment, although it does have a very nice... Uh, Hall effect sensor, which is like encapsulated inside the um, the probe, and it's very nicely grounded. Um, it just doesn't work for our application, so we're we're gonna have to return this one. 
Uh, we got another one. And this is also a Chinese variant. Um, it's the uh, the WT. 10A Tesla meter. This one's giving us very stable readings. Um, it's not doesn't have the uh, resolution of the TD8620, but it is giving us a stable reading, and it does not agree with the MPS Gauss meter. So we have some concern as to the accuracy of our Gauss readings, and the accuracy of the Gauss readings is critical for this experiment because it's 28.025 gigahertz per Tesla. We have to be in a very small Gauss range in order to run this experiment accurately. Um, again, here before we uh, go around to the other side, here is the spy cam view on the sample. You can see the sample is hanging on these strings. Um, these strings are just guide strings that are being held in place by lead weights, and that keeps the sample steady even with the magnetic field turned on. Now we're going to come around to the other side and we're going to show you the Faraday cage. You can see over here there's tubes. These PVC pipes go directly inside the Faraday cage. Um, this is for the uh, the RF input. This is for the uh, spy cam. This is for the USB. This over here is for the power for the uh, electromagnet, and this is for the signal analyzer, um, seeing what's going on. So we're going to come around to the other side, and we'll show you the Faraday cage. Right over here is the Faraday cage. Um, it's a bilayer fire, uh, Faraday cage. It basically has capacitive uh, induction on the entire surface. You see there's two separate layers, an inner layer and an outer layer. They are connected by little, um, uh, little capacitors that are placed every square foot of the Faraday cage. And if you come inside, we'll be able to show you exactly the uh, TESA as we have it set up right now. Okay, so first and foremost, we've had a lot of problems dealing with the, um, the scale measurement because the scale does use a piezoelectric, uh, I believe, and the RF does interfere with it, so we had to ground the hell out of this thing. Like, there is several layers of grounding um, that went into protecting our, uh, um, our uh, scale measurements. Um, we used very thick aluminum foil, there's three or four different separate layers, as well as this sheet over here, a bilayer, that goes directly in between where the RF is coming out and the scale measurement. Um, over here we have the electromagnet, or as Jeremy likes to call it, the EPR NMR laminar spintronic alignment rig. Um, it's basically a massive, um, a massive uh, electromagnet. Right down there is the sample. We currently have it set up with a bismuth iron setup. Um, this over here is the Yagi antenna that we're using to receive the signal. Um, there's a massive capacitor over here that cleans out the output uh, or the, uh, the load for the power supply. Let me check that out. That's a nice 22, 2200 um, millifarads. In yeah, 220,000 uh, microfarads at 15 volts DC. So that's and what? so this coil is only running about... Uh, seven to eight volts in this experiment, so it's uh, well within range. Plenty of stabilization for the length of wires that we have for this coil. Right, and also the entire experiment, the entire electromagnet's only using about 100 watts, so heat is not really an issue. Um, we have seen that in the past when we had less copper on it, it was running around three to 400 watts, and that became an issue. I saw over time the sample started losing weight, magically, just over time. We've we eventually figured out that it was just the heat rising and you know hitting the scale and whatnot. Um, one place we're having lots of issues with is the horns. Um, we have several different uh, horns that we have over here. This one is an FMI. This was donated by um, Scott. He was a guy I met at AlienCon. It's the uh, FMI standard gain horn. It's for this uh, frequency range. This one is a miniature horn that we tried as well. I think I got better results on this per the signal analyzer, and the latest horn that we tried was a custom horn that I built. Uh, it's basically, we're trying to amplify the magnetic component as strong as possible, so we want this design. Um, it basically takes the output of the, um, of the attenuator and just amplifies only, or attenuates only one side, and the other side is, uh, remains constant. We're not sure exactly what kind of, uh, and, uh, horn antenna we actually want. Uh, now as for the signal input, 
It comes in over here, the antenna is in there, it's about a half a centimeter uh, long. It goes into an isolator and then into an attenuator. We're not really trying to attenuate any signal over here, but it's very important we have this attenuator in place because the isolator is does not like magnetic fields. It even has warning stickers on it. This is made out of aluminum or something like that. That is, It's non-ferrous material. Yeah, it's stainless screws, it's an aluminum chassis, and so basically we're just using the attenuator in this place uh, with no attenuation set at, at all to isolate the isolator from the field of the electromagnet. That's, that's the only reason why it's really in the beam path at all. It's basically acting as a waveguide. Yeah, it's pretty much just a waveguide over here. Um, down over here you can see this is the spy cam that we have going on the sample. Um, it has its own little light, which is uh, pretty useful, so you can see what's going on while we're doing the experiment. Um, and you can also show them the, uh, the, the scale measurement, how exactly we're taking the scale. There is a, a lever arm over here on top. So I'll zoom in here and give this string a pull. Let's, uh Get the whole thing so you can see this little thread on the top. I'm pulling up on it now so you can see how that sample moves. It moves pretty freely. The way we're doing our null measurements is just simply by cycling it up and down a few times and letting it come back to rest, making sure that it zeroes properly and that it's not sticking. Uh, we can also adjust the height. It has to really be in the exact center between the uh, top and the bottom motion there in order to not be pulled to one side or the other when the electromagnet turns on and we can verify that when we turn the magnet on at full power and uh, verify that the readings on the scale do not change. So that thread comes up, it goes up to the end of the lever arm, there's the thread that goes up into the scale measurement, up through the shielding and there is a uh, USB based scale there and it's inside here there's a brass rod attached to uh, our pieces of wood and we have some ball bearings in the end just to kind of reduce friction. The amount of torque that is in place from any amount of motion at the end of this lever arm will pretty much supersede any frictional losses that we have on those bearings anyways. But in this case we've gotten pretty reliable measurements out of it and it's it's consistent now which is really important. Yeah, con consistency is very important. We have uh, finally eliminated the noise problem with several different grounding rod wires that are going into both the walls and the floor. This floor is connected to an eight foot rod that's in the center of the room and there's wires that spread out that connect to everything. Uh, for the outer shield it goes to a separate grounding rod that's only four feet so there's two separate grounding rods that are all the way in the ground um, creating a perfect Faraday cage. If we close the door over here we will lose all Wi-Fi signaling and um, cell communications, cell communications, everything. Even the USB cable was coated all the way up, straight through the uh, wall, and then it's covered, of course, with the, with the plate and coated up through the channel. So we really did try to shield out any possible noise contributions as a result of the microwaves bouncing around inside this chamber. So uh, please leave us a comment. Let us know what you think of the uh, experimental setup. If you are an expert in RF horns, we would like to have your data on how we can best try this experiment and get the best results possible. You know, even if it's a negative, so be it. We just want to know the truth and what exactly works with Alzaphon over here. And uh, as you can see from our, our signage, Falcon Space is all about advancing anti-gravity technology. Even if we get a null result, that still is advancing anti-gravity technology, and we need to publish it and show everyone this doesn't work, and this is what we tried. Thank you guys, and peace out.